my, my talk is less actually about baseball today and kind of baseball, uh, or kind of baseball history, um, specifically from the statistics perspective. So let's start with the story. Uh, it's a story I think most of you in the room probably know. Um, it's one that you know ha go goes back quite a ways. Uh, we've had you know illustrious uh, analysts talk about it for uh, you know been weighing in on it for years. Um, and uh, it, it had to make an appearance, Steve. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, let, let's talk about kind of a how um, a group of of individuals that you know that broadened out into a movement kind of took over. They they attacked kind of the forces of tradition um, that were you know delivering software for a, a large period for over for many years. So you know we've got the uh, we, we've got the you know three people who are moving you know the, the representative of, of a lot of people and we've got them. Oh, one second. We've got you know these kind of standard bearers that um, have represented kind of the, the forces of society, and we've got I don't know if you can hear the uh, we've got them attacking the different uh, the different um, people who are companies that have kind of controlled things and really making a, a uh, change. That's actually not the story I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell the equivalent thing in baseball where instead of you know, entrenched, um, entrenched companies like Oracle or IBM or Microsoft, we have the, the, the leagues, the National League and the American League, we have the Elias Sport, Sports Bureau, and more importantly out of anything, we have tradition that really kind of dictated how uh, baseball was run, um, how baseball was played, and what was seen important for over a century. And so I'm gonna talk kind of, you know, as the, the title kind of implies, you know, an homage to, uh, to Eric Raymond's Cathedral in the Bazaar, how open source technology or open source ideas really transformed baseball over the period of you know, 70 to, to 100 years. And so as, as uh, Eric says in the, in the um, Cathedral in the Bazaar, most good software and in baseball, it started with people scratching their, their personal itch. So we've got plenty of people who, you know, have day jobs. They do, the, they do these things because it's fun. Um, and baseball is no different. We have, you know, over in the 40s, the Canadian, sorry, with the 50s and 60s, the um, later called the Canadian Department of Defense's best mind, George Lindsay, uh, who spent, um, his, spent his days doing, you know, nuclear physics, uh, studying, department, um, studying weapons of mass destruction, working operations research for the Canadian government, you know, was speak at the United Nations, work, um, you know, doing all sorts of, of research by day. By night, he, didn't, he enlisted his father. Uh, they would listen to, box, listen to games, keep box scores by hand, and then go through by hand and uh, analyze everything that happened and try to figure out, you know, what the, um, in this situation, I got a runner on first base with two outs, how many runs are gonna score? How important is a base hit, uh, is, is a single? How important is a double? Um, and he just, he did this because it was fun. Um, he did this because he liked, he liked math, he liked solving these problems. He did this even though sometimes his superior officer said, you should not be working on this. Um, he, uh, he was one, at one point based in Norway and his, uh, the, he was working under um, whatever the Department of Defense for Norway is, is called. Um, and his commanding officer there basically ordered him not to publish anything on baseball because he didn't want it reflecting badly on the, the Norwegian military. Uh, that, so that they could waste his time, he could waste his time on something so trivial as baseball. Um, as, a, uh, as, a side, as a side note, uh, you know, kind of coming off of Mandy's talk, uh, his wife was um, a, had a doctorate in x-ray crystallography, I believe, um, from Cambridge, I think it was Cambridge, and worked in the labs, worked in labs um, with uh, Francis Watson. Uh, so we actually worked in multiple Nobel Prize winning labs and then gave up her job when she had kids. And so the, you know, unfortunately that is what they did at the time, or many did at that time, but it's, you know, he was probably, he was potentially the less, uh, the, the less um, heralded one in the relationship. 
Another person who scratches it, it's Earnshaw Cook, who's a retired metallurgist, um, a Princeton grad, very, very proud of his Princeton, of going to Princeton, signed every single personal correspondence with Earnshaw Cook, class of Princeton class of 21. Um, and so he made sure that, uh, that everybody knew that. Uh, he was also a, in, he was also in kind of the, the nuclear space, which is actually a very weird connection for many of the people who did early baseball work. Um, but after he retired, uh, he moved to Baltimore and he was, you know, still despaired kind of the state of statistics that, that were out there. Um, you know, things like what's more, what well, batting average, uh, you know, the, the amount of time a player, um, how many hits a player gets in, at bats was a, you know, the state of the art at the time. And he didn't think that was right. Also, Babe Ruth had come, in, had come up, you know, 20 years before and Babe Ruth, who hit lots and lots of home runs and really kind of changed the game was seen as the best player in baseball. Earnshaw Cook didn't think so. He thought Ty Cobb was better and tried to set out to find numbers to, uh, to prove that. Uh, didn't do quite a great job on proving that, but did a lot of really in-depth work and actually was one of the first people who got lots of press uh, for doing kind of his own side thing, side research into baseball. Um, Sports Illustrated wrote a big story on him. Um, he was quoted often uh, with his projections in the Baltimore Sun. Um, his book, Percentage Baseball, which uh, I think was republished in 2003, is a, it's a really interesting read. Um, he pulls in all sorts of Latin quotations and really kind of gibberish around statistics. And so statisticians can't follow it because it's not really good math. Uh, lay people can't follow it because it's got a bunch of gibberish statistics and Latin quotations in it. But it's a, it's, it's a very, interesting read and you know emblematic of somebody else who who just for the love of, of figuring out the problem spent his time on this we also have a pair of uh, self-publishing brothers uh, who were computer programmers by trade um, Harlan and Elron Mills or Elron Mills who some of you who have a deep history in kind of the history of computing may know Harlan Mills was called a super programmer for IBM uh, he invented the, uh, or was one of the, the main drivers behind the clean room um, development philosophy. He, uh, you know, he said, uh, had, this is one of his more famous quotes. He also had a one I find less uh, illuminating about how interactive debuggers are, um, are horrible and nobody should use them. Um, so I, you know, he can, people can be right, people can be wrong. Uh, <laughs> But he and his brother actually got into, just decided to um, use the new computing technology that came out and start trying to figure out how to do things in baseball with, uh, with these, this new uh, massive sets of computer processing that uh, were on the mainframes. Um, to do this, he ended up having to essentially purchase the play-by-play -play data from, uh, the, from the Elias Sports Bureau. Uh, this was at that time was you know ten thousand dollars I think, which you know my uh, I, I didn't actually do the inflation, but that's probably what a couple hundred thousand dollars today just to get you know in this game the runner moved from here to here, um, and that was the only option. You know most people couldn't do that. We'll come we'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, that was the kind of data they needed. They translated it from probably the pieces of paper uh, that, uh, that Elias gave them into punch cards, ran that through, and then did pretty similar thing to what uh, George Lindsay did of, uh, let's figure out in this situation, how much did this play contribute to winning the game? Um, and this is actually something that was very much, uh, was very innovative, continues to be seen, was reinvented multiple times. Um, and uh, continue to be seen innovative into, in, well into, uh, you know, the, the mid-2000s, um, actually one of the first things I did in my spare time was generate a, new, a, version, a newer version of this. Um, so it, it's, you know, they were 40 years ahead of time. Um, if anybody ever finds that book, it, there's, it's, it was self-published in 1970. If anybody ever finds the actual physical copy, let me know. <laughs> I really want to find it. There is an online copy of it, uh, but that's, it's not the same as holding it in my hand. Um, and the last person I want to kind of talk about and who's scratching his own itch is essentially Sabermetrics uh, Linus Torvalds. He's kind of the, uh, he, he's, you know, similarly curmudgeonly, 
Um, similarly, kind of got into, uh, you know, did this kind of to, to uh, because he didn't like what was going on in, in, you know, in this case, mainstream baseball, thought things were wrong. Um, you probably have heard of Bill James, uh, or you may have heard of Bill James, um, if you're a baseball fan. Um, he actually got his start studying baseball while working nights at a canning company in Kansas, or in Kansas City. Um, where he would basically, you know, he would go out in his patrol, uh, come back, uh, grab a desk, and start pouring over the, the statistics he could find at hand, writing his own books and publishing them. Um, but he did lots of things but to challenge the kind of the status quo of how we understand baseball. Um, you know, he looked at whether errors, uh, or errors were kind of the traditional way of, of knowing how good a fielder was. Um, you know, how many mistakes did they make? He's like, that's stupid. The people who are the best fielders get two more balls, and they're probably going to have more errors just because they actually touch a ball. They, they can touch the ball more often. The ball's not getting by. So, you know, let's look at that instead. And that, he did that for that. For that, he did it, looked in the sacrifice bunch, looked in the stolen bases. Um, but more than all of what he did and the questions he asked, he was a really good writer. Uh, and that actually, I think, has done more to publish or to, to kind of push this forward than... Um, any other, anybody else, and this is really the, when, when he started self-publishing, um, and then when he got picked up in the early 80s to write an annual book of uh, recap of the season with these physical things, that's really when this started to take off in the more mainstream area. Uh, so looking backwards, we've got uh, two, you know, seminally important moments, both open source and uh, baseball statistics that I don't think anybody really understood the significance when they happened. But on the left, you probably can't see it. It's Linus's uh, email announcing his uh, his um, his version of Minix, basically, which obviously became Linux um, and changed computing for basically forever. This is an ad from the back of the, a little tiny ad prop. I mean, that's it, it probably was you know this big, but that big in the back of Sporting News in 1977, where Bill James tried to publish basically was advertising his first abstract. That had similar impact on the baseball community um, and has you know, not only changed how the public consumes the game, but how the teams, consume, how the teams deal with the game now. Beyond the impact of the individual in open, in open source, um, a huge piece of it is collaboration, and baseball was, is no different. Uh, I mentioned how hard it was to, for the Mills brothers to get play-by-play -play data. Um, the Elias Sports Bureau uh, basically has had box scores and play-by-play -play locked up f for you know on their own probably for 50, 60 years. They would give it to you, they, they would give it out occasionally. Um, the, they gave it out to the guy who created Stratomatic Baseball, for example, for him to build his game. Um, but you know Bill James couldn't get that data. Uh, the average person off the street couldn't get that data. You could get some things from the Baseball Encyclopedia, but that's a book like you know this thick that you had to go through by hand and find what you needed. Um, that was pretty much untenable for, for James and other people who wanted to study baseball. So they actually put together a group called Project Scoresheet, whose responsibility was basically, who, who, who was going to go out and their job was to fill the gap of affordable play-by-play -play data. Uh, how do we go, uh, you know, we're going to go listen to games, we're going to go watch games, we're going to code it in a much deeper way than you can get from the, from the newspaper. So this is actually a, every ball in play is supposed to be mapped as to, you know, it landed in this zone right here, um, and that was going to be in the code, and people could actually use that to now do much more advanced things because we just have better data. Um, and this was, you know, basically a network of volunteers. At some point later on, they, they started getting paid a little bit, but as people who, who wanted this data, wanted to be part of something, um, and this is how they, they thought they could contribute. We also have Rec Sports Baseball, um, you know, our, our very own uh, Usenet group to, uh, to do all sorts of uh, analysis. Um, this, I, I was not involved in this community, uh, but I'm, a lot of my, uh, kind of, a lot of my online friends were there who kind of get started before, uh, slightly before I did in this. Um, it was really the first place where, where people were able to contribute, or to, to, to meet like-minded people online, talk in detail about sports and sports statistics in general. Um, and so that led to a lot of early, uh, 
early breakthroughs in, in studying stats. Um, for those of you who are interested in the community or who, who know the space at all, uh, Voros McCracken, who created uh, defense independent pitching statistics, which is a really fancy way of saying once the ball goes in play, the pitcher doesn't have a whole lot of control what happens. Um, that was a huge, huge breakthrough and contrary to what everybody believed in baseball for over 100 years, that, that got its start on Rec Sports Baseball. Um, and this, the people who were involved in, in this community went on to, took, their, took what they learned here, and what they, the connections they made here, and they went out to start a lot of the early baseball publications. Uh, baseball Prospectus, uh, the big, big Bad Baseball Annual, um, other things uh, that, uh, other um, things that then have led into today, you know, fan graphs, um, uh, baseball reference, and, and the things that fans know and use today. There's also a more direct interaction between baseball and open source, um, where you know there are there are tr true open source kind of um, things that are used for baseball. So RetroSheet is a um, is a group that's been around, I think, since the uh, 1989, um, and they were the successor, the kind of the, the spiritual successor to Project, Project Score Sheet. Project Sport Score Sheet actually uh, succumbed to a, uh, um, a something that's actually fairly common in open source too, where somebody decided to take what Project Score Sheet was doing and go make money off of it, um, and you know that became Stats Inc. Uh, but that kind of left the people who were doing Project Score Sheet, you know, without an avenue to get their data um, or to, to generate. So RetroSheet kind of came in to, to fill that void and actually expand time backwards. So they've done amazing amounts of work to build this entire play-by-play uh, -play record from stretching all the way back into pre to 1950 right now. We have, for the most, we, we probably have 90 to 95% coverage of this is what happened on every play. Um, from 1950 on. Uh, we have box scores all the way back to pretty much complete through 1920 or earlier. Um, and this is basically just a set of volunteers who did it. Uh, you know, they, they all had day jobs. Um, I was, one of my biggest regrets, I worked for IBM in Poughkeepsie for a couple of years, um, you know, about 10 years ago. And uh, one of the major, the major contributors to this worked upstairs for me and I never went up and thanked him for what he did. So I kind of still, still regret not, uh, not thanking him for that. But um, other things, uh, other open source, uh, early open source baseball things, Sean Lehman, um, who is a, now at least is a reporter for the Democrat Chronicle in, uh, in Rochester, New York, basically in 1995 said, I'm going to publish, I'm going to publish my own electronic version of a baseball encyclopedia. I'm going to give you, uh, at the time, Excel files, uh, and then access files, and now we get SQL files of uh, basically every statistic that happens in baseball, every player who's ever played. Um, this was you know, an amazing resource at that time in, in 1985. This is where I really got my start. I wrote a, uh, probably, this was I think my freshman year of college, so 97, 98, uh, I wrote a really, really horrible paper on the Hall of Fame using this. Um, but it was my first, you know, real uh, uh, in-depth look into well, in-depth look into baseball stats. Um, that was, you know, a, uh, a way to kind of, you know, scratch my personal itch of what I like, uh, of what I like doing, and combine it with um, with the things I was doing for for career or career prep. Two thousand seven uh, was really the probably a, the the turning point on all of this. Uh, pitch FX um, was, w which is uh, pieces of information about everything, or everything information we have about a pitch. Where was it released? Where did the, what was the movement on it? Where did it cross the plate? How fast was it going? This was kind of released accidentally by baseball uh, in that they wanted it to show up on their, uh, on their web app. So in order for it to show up on their web app, they published an XML stream. Well, somebody kind of figured out where that XML stream was and started scraping it. And you know, there were tons and tons of articles now about that about, okay, how do you build this up? How do you, t uh, here, here's, some, here's some Python code or Perl code that'll scrape it for you and dump it to where you want. Um, here's how you tie that together with RetroSheet. Here's how you can start doing analysis with it. 
Um, and it actually led into things like you know, open source projects, uh, Baseball on a Stick, which in their, its initial conception was, here's basically a USB key, that I, I can, you can run, here's a USB key where you can um, get all the information you need about baseball, carry it wherever you want, and then you know, type, plug it in a computer and start doing analysis with it. Um, and so, you know, that, this, this is really where this next phase of analysis kind of kicked off. It was a very social one. This is a time where everybody had blogs. Uh, so, you know, there are random baseball things on, you know, totally defunct, now almost entirely defunct blogs. Um, I wrote, I did my share of writing on my own personal blog, which then I lost the uh, domain name for and can't get back. Uh, so it's now, you know, horribly formatted on a different site. Uh, but the, um, it, it's, it really started the sense of, it really started a broad online community doing really in-depth work. And this is the first time where you've got now big data, big-ish data, two billion data points a year, which is you know, huge compared to what baseball was dealing with before. You start getting more technical expertise, you start really bringing in um, people who know how to do, who, who, whose interests are computing, whose interests are statistics and math in a way that is making, um, that, that, that where they can consistently do it and they have now the information and the ability in which to, to, to make use of it. And we even start going into open source analysis uh, where, you know, um, wins above replacement is probably the way people, t uh, you measure player um, value right now. And so this group of professors got together and said, we're going to build a completely open source framework that we think is going to beat um, all the other published systems as to the, the, the equality of it. And so this is, you know, they published a 30 page paper, they have, an, um, they, they have a GitHub repo where you can go uh, download this and you can you know, see how baseball players build up their value. You can say, I think this should be changed, submit a pull request and you know, it may actually make it into there. And so this level of collaboration um, is you know, very common in the open source world. It's kind of weird in sports. Uh, you know, we've never really, we've, we've never really done this, we've never really explored sports to this level of detail or opened it up to this broad of a uh, community. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the parallel now in, in baseball specifically with kind of that open source has, with the open source, the, the win for open source, you know, that, that now it's open source is in the enterprise. It is, in many cases, the predominant way of doing business. Um, it's, there's no going back from it. And Sabermetrics had kind of a, a similar um, way of, or a similar outcome. Um, it took longer, and win is a tough term because it's not like how um, in Moneyball, you know, it's not like, oh, we're, we're in, stats are in, scouts and, and role time players are out. It's not like that, but there, there's, there is, there's pieces of it. We, we work together, but, but Moneyball was really the first big um, Moneyball and the Oakland A's were really the first big play team to do this. This was the stat guys, the math guys are now in the door. Um, it had happened in the you know occasionally before. Uh, Branch Rickey's Dodgers in the 40s had a statistician named uh, Alan Roth, who would um, who would help you know uh, figure out batting orders, figure out matchups, that kind of thing. There were occasionally other people. Earl Weaver would carry little index cards of every everybody on his, he was playing against, who would say, "Okay, I want to. This guy's hit three against three for nine against this pitcher." That's actually not great statistics, but it was hugely uh, hugely different from how decisions were normally made in the in the dugout. Um, but Moneyball in 2001, 2000, when the book came out in 2003, uh, this actually showed that this was now a career people could do. Um, anybody before this didn't really have, didn't really have illusions of it being a career. It was a, it was a fun thing um, we could do in our spare time. But you know, since a after that point, we started getting, um, you know, people who were doing analysis in the public space were now coming out. They were getting jobs in teams. All of these people were people who were writers who then moved inside to, to the front office. We now do things like, you know, we, we now um, use all the information we have to, and, and all these things we've learned from kind of this public collaborative space to help make the teams better. 
Um, and so just like open source has won um, in, in the enterprise and in computing in general, Sabermetrics has won in baseball. Um, and again, it's, it is now an essential way of how teams make decisions, how teams uh, decide what players go after, what they do on the field, um, and you know how they how we develop players and, and all that. And it's all you know for the most part that this generation is all thanks to what we could do online and what we could do from a collaboration perspective. One thing I do want to point out here is if you look at this list of names, there there are no women on this list. There are very few non-white men on this list. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that, that is a, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's frankly an embarrassment with how we've done in hiring um, in, the, in the front office. And I think it's, it's a problem that the teams are starting to recognize, the problems that Major League Baseball is starting to recognize, and, and we are, we're trying to do, to do better at it. Um, so I do want to just kind of pull, um, mention something that MLB announced last week. Uh, they, we, the league is um, essentially sponsoring, but, but, but setting up a diversity fellowship um, to, to encourage women and people of color to apply to teams. Um, there are you know, 23 positions for recent graduates. There's going to be, I think, 20 teams who are doing it, and then three, player, three people will be at the Office of, commission, the, office of the Commissioner. Um, so if anybody, if you know anybody who kind of fits this character, fits this, this character, who wants to work in sports, um, please encourage them to apply. Uh, the Brewers are one of the teams participating, um, and so we're, we're, we're excited to see what we get. Obviously, we're doing our own efforts on the, the hiring front for that as well. Um, but it's, you know, as everybody has said, you know, throughout this, throughout this the, a diverse team is a better team. Um, and we know we're leaving, we're leaving talent uh, kind of on the vine, um, and it's something that I think we're trying to do better. Uh, and so, you know, please, uh, please pass this on to anybody who might want to work in sports. It's not just analysts. Um, you, know, you don't have to know how to code, as Steve mentioned. It will help in many of the jobs. Um, but you know, anything if you want to get indoor in baseball, um, this is a good way to do. This is a good opportunity. Uh, and then you know, special thanks to uh, both uh, Eric Raymond for the Cathedral and the Bazaar, which kind of inspired the talk, and then uh, Alan Schwartz's The Numbers Game, the history of sabermetrics up through probably 2007 or so. Uh, phenomenal book. Um, much has changed since then, but it is kind of probably the seminal history of how we got to where we are. Um, and that's, that's about it. And now. Uh,